Mina, Ohio Gazimas. Jesus Freaking Gamer here. It's morning time again, and I'm finally coming at you with last Sunday's message. Um, I already left the apology video yesterday stating how it was absolutely ridiculous how things have been going, and uh, ended up waking up at like 12 midnight this morning. So yeah, this is my, it's 7.30 where I'm at right now, so seven and a half hours into my day. Um, the giant beard's gone, and uh, so that, that feels so good. It's starting to get itchy. Glad that's really gone. And yeah, all I can say is I'm sorry that it took so long for this 30 minute message to get out. I don't care if anyone has watched it or not. That's actually not the most important thing. The most important thing is getting these things out on time, and I just failed abysmally at this. And I have apologized once, and I'll apologize again. I am sorry it took me so long. For the day when someone does see this message, I need to be timely. I need to be on point. I'm going to work on that. And I plan on releasing a few more um, messages today. Whoa. Took a minute for the camera to get into focus there. So, yeah, I am going to... This is going to be a 30-minute message, or at least longer than 5 to 7 minutes. And I'm just going to cover a giant psalm in the Word of God. Because after I did the little psalm message I did at some point last week... I was like, you know, it, it really, it's important to me to look at any psalm, any praise, any worship, and think, you know, that's the worship of God. That's really important. I mean, it's the biggest book in the Bible, so God has quite a bit of priority on it. And so when I walked away from finishing up 2 Samuel chapter 22, I was like, you know, I think I'm just going to cover this psalm, and I'm just going to read this psalm. It's, it's a little bit lengthy. I, I don't know if I'll even be able to cover all of it in 30 minutes, especially not with commentary. But I want to cover a lot of it, and I just want to lead you guys in a worshipful, praise-type atmosphere. This is late. Once again, I'm sorry. I've already told the Lord I was sorry as well. So even And it may not be better late than never, because when it comes to the Lord's bread that's on His table, it needs to be fresh. It needs to be timely, and I get that primarily from the Old Testament tabernacle passages where the priests were to make it fresh every morning. They were to dispose of yesterday's bread. And just like the manna that the Israelites ate, they ate it every single day. It was only saved an extra day on, sat on Fridays so they didn't have enough for Saturday the Sabbath. And on that one day, the bread wouldn't go moldy um, and nasty overnight. But other than that, it had to be served every single day. So two examples where the Word of God has to be daily. It has to be regular. It has to be fresh. So all I can say is I'm sorry that this is coming late. Obviously, I have a ways to go in my ministry. And just because I'm in YouTube, that doesn't really give me much of an excuse. I don't think. So I do again, when I apologize to you guys, I mean it. When I repented of this as a sin before the Lord, I meant that. I goofed up. I still want to get this message to you guys, and I want to make up for all the messages that I missed this week. So I'm going to be productive today. Man, I get out um, five messages today. It's Friday, so Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, five messages. And Sunday, I released a quick little thing, so that wasn't a 30-minute message. So I have a ways to make up. And I've apologized enough. Uh, once, quite frankly, is enough. If you don't forgive me, then there's nothing I can do except for to say, you know, Hit the dislike button and unsubscribe. Um, if you don't want to forgive me, you certainly don't have to. I believe that's in the Lord's nature to forgive, but that doesn't mean humans necessarily do so. And if you lost trust in me, quite frankly, I wouldn't blame you. Hopefully that's not the case. Hopefully I won't lose subscribers over this. If I do, I have only myself to blame. I will keep moving forward. I'll try to learn from this mistake. And that is almost four minutes off the clock, so let's get started on this message. Even though the timeliness was important, I think to mention. We're going to kick this off in 2 Samuel chapter 22, verse 2. And all of this is essentially, not exactly, but it's almost a complete reiteration of Psalm 18. So check out um, 2 Samuel 22 and Psalm 18 for this, for this chapter, for this Psalm of David. It's good stuff. Let's go into this. And he said, David said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. God is the place where we are grounded. He's the face where we are. He, he's the face. He's the person, and he's the foundation where we are solidified. He's the place where we um, can, be, can be safe. He's the place where we have um, a place of safety, of, um, of, of sanctity. He's a place where we can stand firm and stand strong. And we know the foundation is not going to crumble. It's not going to be like quicksand and suck us in. We can stand safely and securely on and in Him. 
Verse 3, the God of my strength in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold and my refuge, my Savior, you save me from violence. A giant reiteration, reiteration of verse 2. Plus, he's the God of strength. He's not only the God where you can stand and he's the God where you know you're safe. He is the God of your strength that you can trust in. He will bring you salvation. He'll save you from violence. Not only in Him can you defend, stand, and be strong. In Him you can attack the strongholds in your life. You can even attack the strongholds in your friends' lives through prayer, through praise and worship, and other divine weapons that the Lord gives us. It's all founded in Him. It all starts in Him in a relationship with Him. And my Savior, you save me from violence. Ultimately, He's the one that's going to save you. It's not going to be yourself. It's not going to be your friends. It's not going to be your family. It's not going to be random coincidence and circumstance. God is the Savior. He doesn't always save from violence. Like the story in Cain and Abel, the unrighteous one killed the righteous one. Jesus, the righteous one, was put to death. Those things don't escape God's notice, but God does allow those things for a reason. That sounds cliche as can be, but it is true. God allowed Jesus' death for all of us to be saved. I'm not sure exactly why he allowed Abel's death, but he did. I do know that it speaks of in Hebrews how the blood of Jesus speaks better things than the blood of Abel. Kind of like the blood of Jesus cries out for forgiveness. Whereas it says in Genesis that your brother's blood is calling to me from the ground, therefore I curse you. And it, 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 if, if nothing else, a great juxtaposition can be drawn from that. And like, that's a horrible reason to let a person die. Well, keep in mind that death isn't exactly the same in the eyes of the Lord as it is with us. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. That is in another psalm. When someone who knows God dies, they go to him. When someone who's cursed dies, they're separated from God forever. It's another new beginning when someone who knows the Lord dies. The Lord can keep us down here, and He can protect us. However, He can also allow us to die. He can take us home to be with Him. And as Christians, those of us who are Christians, that's the way we need to see that. Abel, it was a painful way, more than likely to get home, but he went home. And Jesus had to die for our salvation. And one day, when we leave this world, we will be, we be with Him forever. And we will ultimately know Him as Savior. And violence will never touch us again. On to verse 4. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. And you know what? The Lord does sometime allow His servants to die. But there are also times when the Lord ushers His servants into great victory. David stood before the giant Goliath. A much better, much more powerful warrior than him. And David slammed him to the ground with one stone. And I'm not, gonna, I'm not trying to say that that was a miracle that it happened. Maybe there was a perfectly natural explanation for how that one stone from a sling killed Goliath despite his helmet just immediately. Maybe there is a natural explanation for that. I know a sling, when it throws something, can put, there's, gonna be, there's a lot of power there. Possibly enough to penetrate old Bronze Age armor. Very possibly. That may not have been a miracle. Nonetheless, that doesn't mean the Lord wasn't behind that swing and behind that throw. And it doesn't mean the Lord did not save him from that enemy. And all the other times David went into combat, all the other times David waged war against his enemies, God was with him each and every time. And David continuously won. The Lord sometimes brings us home, but you know what? Sometimes He leads us into victory after victory after victory after victory after victory down here. We fight tooth and nail and we win again and again and again and again and we tear down the strongholds of the enemy in our lives. We tear down the strongholds of the enemy in other people's lives. We can even stand up and become pillars in our community, in our state, in our nation. Just like God raised up David as king, raised up Daniel to be the right-hand man of Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar eventually converted over to, to the worship of Yahweh and to the God of Israel. Because I, I have no doubt, not only was it because Daniel was nearby and Daniel was an advisor, I don't doubt for a second. And I know this isn't biblical, but I don't doubt for a second that Daniel, being the man that he was, prayed for his king day and night. 
And eventually those prayers got through to that king. And the king of the most powerful nation of that day turned to the God of Israel for salvation and forgiveness. Verse 5, And the waves of death surrounded me. The floods of ungodliness made me afraid. The sorrows of Sheol surrounded me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress I called upon the Lord. I cried out to my God. He heard my voice from his temple, and my cry entered his ears. Sometimes it's very easy for us to look at the circumstances of life, to look at the ables that are in life. Just had to kill a little bug there. Sorry. And we just... We look at those things, we just we kind of give up hope on the inside. We just kind of stop. We just kind of quit. And let me tell you, that's not what the Lord's will is. Yes, we see brothers and sisters going to God fairly often. By the way, 20th century some more martyrs for the church than the previous 19th century, 19th centuries put together. Plenty of people died in the name of Jesus in the 20th century. It's not like Christians are immune. It's not like believers don't suffer. It's not like we, don't, we can't be killed and we can't die. And we're just absolutely protected from anything and everything. That is not the case. Sometimes the Lord does allow us to perish. Sometimes He does allow us to go home to Him. Quite frankly, I see that as a get-out-of-jail-free, get you know, collect, cross, go, collect $200. That's the way I see that. It's almost like an out from all the crap that's in this world. But the Lord can definitely hear our cry in this life. And He definitely answers the prayer of His people. When you're going through hard times, the goal isn't to just give up and die and say, Oh, well, I guess I'm able. I guess I'm just going to kick the big one here. No. You call out to God. You cry out to Him. And He hears your voice from heaven. Your cry enters His ears. The Lord loves you. He cares about you. I myself can say many, many times, yeah, I've done a bunch of stupid stuff in my life. Yeah, there have been times I've fallen down and failed, but I've gotten back up. I stand on my rock. I stand in my fortress. I stand from the one that is my strength and whom I can trust. And the Lord has given me several victories on top of all the defeats I've had. I don't know which one outnumbers which, I do know I'm so thankful for the life that I'm living right now. Being able to do YouTube and minister to you guys and talk with you guys and hang out with you guys. Being able to live for Him. Being able to live with a relatively healthy body. Being able to eat when I want to and not worry about electricity going out on me and not worry about being evicted from my home. Haven't always been in this comfortable position, but I did not give up. I didn't stop. I kept pressing forward, and even past the death of my mom, I did not give up on my God. I kept crying out to Him, saying, Lord, I know You're bigger than my circumstances. You're bigger than my situation. And sure enough, He delivered me out of all of that. I was able to stand in Him as my stronghold and my refuge, my Savior, the one who protects me from violence. He heard my voice from heaven. He answered my cry and entered into His ears. And here I sit before you today, able to do YouTube, able to do all the things I just mentioned before. Because he's a good God. And he leads his people in victory. Even the death of his saints is often victory. A very famous saying, I would challenge you to Google this and look it up, that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Even those things can be victories for our God. Because there's nothing he can't turn around for his good. Just like when Joseph was thrown into the um, Egyptian prison by his brothers and he was in prison for over a decade. But by the end of that, he was the right hand man by Pharaoh. Leading an entire nation into salvation in the name of his God. That's what our God, what Jesus can do for us. And then verse 8, it gets kind of, it gets kind of, whoa, this is kind of, it's kind of a big deal. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of heaven quaked and were shaken because he was angry. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. Smoke went up from his nostrils. I love that dragon analogy there. That just, it's so funny to me. It's like, and like little smoke is coming out of the nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Freaking dragons, y'all. Freaking dragons. Our God's a dragon. 
Hopefully no one thinks I'm some blasphemer or heretic here. But that's what that sounds like. And I personally have no problem with that. I think that's awesome. Coals were kindled by it. For a coal to be kindled by fire, that's a hot fire. That's a very hot fire. Verse 10, he bowed the heavens also and came down with darkness under his feet. He rode upon a cherub and flew. By the way, cherubs aren't those little cute fat baby things that you see. You read the book of Ezekiel, cherubs have, what is it? They have four wings, they have four faces, and they carry the throne of God. When He, he literally rode upon the cherubim in the book of Ezekiel. Read Ezekiel chapter 1, you're not going to see some weak little baby fat thing. You're going to see a mighty, powerful being that you would definitely not want to meet down a dark alley on his bad side. He rode upon a cherub and flew, and he was seen upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness canopies around him, dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. By the way, just a note, God is fearsome to his enemies. God's wrath is not something to be messed with. He is a God of light, he is a God of love, but darkness at the same time surrounds him, a deep darkness. And it is not, it can be a place of great soothing and comfort if you know him. If you don't know, it is the most terrifying darkness you'll ever be through. Because once again, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. There is a darkness around God that can't be underestimated or neglected or ignored. It's very, very serious. God isn't joking around when he comes in wrath and in judgment. And that does still apply to New Testament times. Uh, read what happened to King Herod when he did not obey, when he did not give glory to God, when the men and women in the audience cried out, this is the voice of a God, not a man. And he didn't deflect credit to the God of Israel. And worms ate him, and he died there on the spot. And that's in the book of Acts. Again, Google's your friend. Look that up. The wrath and the darkness of God are very real, and they apply today. Verse 13, from the brightness before him, coals of fire were kindled. Once again, the more traditionally known aspect of God is light. With his light and with his fire, coals are kindled, and there is a brightness before him that human eyes are just, there's no way we can hope to see it. Um, understand it, comprehend it, not all of it. All we know is that something big, bright, and powerful is coming our way, and it's bright enough to, to kindle coals of fire. Verse 14, the Lord thundered from heaven, and the Most High uttered his voice. He sent out arrows and scattered them, lightning bolts, and he vanquished them. When it's time to punish the wicked, God knows how to do it, and he's very capable of doing it. <clears throat> Verse 16, Then the channels of the sea were seen, the foundations of the world were uncovered, at the rebuke of the Lord, at the blast of the breath of his nostrils. The parting of the Red Sea was not a really huge demonstration of his power. Let's keep in mind that this is the God that created the entire universe in seven days. For him to lay bare the foundation of the world, to unveil it, for him to roll up the seas like a giant carpet and expose what's underneath, without a single thread of moisture to even keep the ground underneath the oceans moist. And it says in the book of Exodus, when Moses and the Israelites parted through the Red Sea, that they crossed on dry ground. Every bit of moisture was just sucked up out of the earth. That's a small, a small display of God's power. To put it another way, when at the end of the age and the resurrection of the dead occurs, it's not going to make God wince. It's not going to make him take a deep breath. It's not going to make him have to flex his muscles. It's not going to be a thing for him. The all-powerful God doesn't struggle to take care of these things. He's very, very capable of taking care of himself, of bringing his people not only into heaven, but of also leading his people in this life into victory, into prosperity, into health. He doesn't always choose that. But he certainly can, he certainly has, and he certainly will. And by the way, the health and the prosperity, I'm not a health and prosperity guy, but if you look at the lives of the people that were with God throughout the entire course of the Bible, yeah, there was some suffering. Yeah, there were some problems. Yeah, some people died in his name. There were a lot of people that overturned entire nations in his name. There were a lot of people that raised the dead and healed the sick in his name. 
yeah, there's suffering that we need to do, just as Jesus himself suffered, but Jesus' ministry, the first thing he's known for is miracles, for healing, for raising the dead. There's a lot of victory in our God. Don't lose focus on that because of, of the darkness in this life. He is our rock, our fortress, our deliverer, our strength. He hears us when we call out to him. He hears our voice from heaven and our cry enters his ears. Don't forget that. That's important. Verse 17, he sent from above, he took me, he drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy, from those who hated me, for they were too strong for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. He also brought me out into a broad place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. I feel I want to keep going with this so bad. There are so many sermons where I feel like I need a part two. Because 30 minutes just is not enough to recount the glory and the majesty of my God. How many of you are in deep waters right now? How many of you are suffering and having a hard time and are afraid and are surrounded by darkness right now? How many of you think there's no way out of the situation you're in right now? I'm telling you that Jesus Christ he can be the one who will deliver you out of all of that mess. Maybe not overnight, maybe not instantly, maybe not in a way that you could foresee, maybe not even in a way that you would particularly choose or even like. I didn't like losing my mom. I didn't like losing that home I was in. But the place where I'm standing now is a good, strong one. And the Lord delivered me out of all of those hardships and out of all of those adversities. He can do the same thing for you. I'm not saying he necessarily will. I'm not saying he's going to take care of your, get rid of your cancer. I'm not saying he's going to whoop your kid into shape, well, quite frankly, ever, because he does respect our free will. He respects our choice. But he can give you peace through the storm. He can give you peace through the hard times as long as they last. And you know what? He is capable of curing cancer, and he is capable of turning hearts around to him if we will cry out to him with all of our heart and with all of our faith. He is certainly capable of doing that. Don't lose sight of the fact that there can be victory in Jesus. So right now, what I want to do is challenge all of you who have stuck with me to this message, who don't know Jesus right now. He's not your Lord. He's not your Savior. Will you make him your Savior right now? Will you reach out your arm and say, God, I need your help. I need you. I can't do this on my own anymore. I'm surrounded by darkness, and it's not your darkness. Or maybe it is. Maybe, maybe you deserve his wrath. Maybe, quite frankly, you deserve the consequences you're going through. Don't hang up on me yet. Don't click out of the video just yet. Take a second and be honest with yourself. Come on. If you're completely honest with yourself, a lot of you will know that you've landed yourself in the situation you're in. And I'm here to tell you that God can deliver you out of your own mess. He can deliver you out of your own darkness. He can take you out of the place that you've brought yourself and he can set you on high ground. He can set you in the fortress of his love and under the banner of his peace. He can deliver you out of the crap you're in right now. What that's going to require from you, you're acknowledging that you're a sinner. You're acknowledging that you've done wrong. You acknowledge that you need his help. That you will believe that Jesus Christ died for you on the cross and three days later rose again. That's what you need to believe. That's what you need to do. And it really is that simple. I'm not asking you to give money to me or my channel. I'm not asking you to give money to some church. I'm not even necessarily going to request that you start going to church every week and reading your Bible every day. Those are good ideas. They're not bad ideas, but those things won't save you. Jesus alone can do that. So if you want to, if you're feeling the Lord's tugging on your heart, just call out to Him right now. Ask Him for His love. Ask Him for His grace, for His peace, for His forgiveness. He readily eagerly offers those things to anyone and everyone who calls out to him. If you want like a model prayer or something to follow, pray after me. Pray this prayer. Say, Lord Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner. I admit that I need you. I pray you forgive me of my sins. I believe that you, Jesus, died on the cross for my sins. I believe that you rose again three days later to guarantee me eternal life with you in heaven. Thank you for hearing this prayer. 
Thank you for your forgiveness and thank you for your eternal life. Help me with the problems I'm going through now. Deliver me out of them and show me how strong you are, God. In Jesus' name, amen. If you just prayed that prayer, good news, friend, you are now a member of the kingdom of God. You're my brother or sister in Christ, and that is awesome! Welcome to the family. Welcome to the church. Maybe you never thought you'd be a member of the church. Maybe you never thought that the day would come when you actually turn over your faith to God. Well, congratulations, that day has come. It's happened. And trust me when I say, you're better off for it. And if you stay with Him, you will not regret it. As far as going to church and reading the Bible go, going to church, finding a group of people who believe the same thing as you, who can encourage you in your faith, is a very good idea. It's something that you do want to do. Reading the Bible every day, it's like a love letter from the one you love the most in the entire world. It's a good idea to read that every single day. Because no matter how little you've studied or how little you know, Reading it every single day will avail you a lot. It will help. You can get something from it every day, especially now that the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. He's there to teach you God's Word. He's here to teach you who He is, what He's about. And the Word of God is going to teach you how to hear His voice, how to think like Him, what, what's in His heart. So thank you guys very much for watching this video. If you like... Well, no, that I typically don't give a I typically don't give a, a traditional video outro for these messages because I feel like I don't want to self promote myself at this time. Not that I could, and I certainly could, but I really want this time to be more about Jesus. So forget the video, forget liking or disliking or subscribing or whatever. That's not really important. For those of you who accepted Jesus, that's awesome. Welcome to the family. For those of you who listened this far, but you, didn't, you decided not to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, still thank you very much for watching. Thank you for giving consideration to my words. Hopefully it gave you something to think about. Hopefully at some point in the future these words will be a little bit more convincing, a little bit more um, revelatory to you. And at the very, very least, maybe it just gave you something to think about. It gave you a quick chuckle, something to laugh about. At the very, very least, maybe it was just entertainment, and that's fine. I know I love you the way God loves you the way. His love isn't limited to just His children, although His deliverance and His promises are for His children. So, consider becoming a Christian today. Consider what you've heard this day. And thank you all very much for watching this video. I love you, and God bless.